Today on the podcast we're talking about firestorms. Of course a firestorm sounds like something from a sci-fi film but they are real. They happened in Hamburg in 1943 and they happened in Dresden in Tokyo and of course in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. We associate firestorms with nuclear war or at least I do and yet Hamburg, Dresden, Tokyo their firestorms were created through conventional explosives. You don't need a monstrous atomic or hydrogen bomb to create this hell on earth. It happened through ordinary conventional explosives. Ordinary bombs can create fires which are so hot that they can melt glass, for example. And of course that directly links us to nuclear war because we think of the scene in Threads where once the bomb has dropped, the milk bottles on the, on the doorstep melt in the heat. That's a scene from Threads which I saw as a toddler and has stayed with me forever, the milk bottles melting on the doorstep. And yet Hamburg and Dresden, under conventional bombing, saw fire so hot that their milk bottles would have melted, their window glass melted. The temperatures in the fires in uh, Hamburg and Dresden could reach up to 800 degrees. Melting glass, turning people to ash, making the brickwork of the buildings glow a dull red, as Keith Lowe mentioned, I believe, in his book Inferno, which is about Hamburg. Firestorms also are so powerful that they, they take, they steal, they rip the oxygen from the air. So even if you're not in the fire, nowhere near the flames, safely away from the smoke, hidden down in a basement or cellar or bunker, the fire can still rip the oxygen from your lungs and you suffocate. So before we look closely at firestorms, what exactly are they and how do they work? And again, it's thanks to Keith Lowe in his book Inferno for giving me this simple explanation of what causes a firestorm and it's really at its most basic level the fact that warm air rises. Now I assume we all learned that at school in science classes but warm air rises. So in Hamburg for example or Dresden incendiary bombs were dropped which started fires. Those fires gathered into one big conflagration and in the tremendous heat of that fire the warm air, the impossibly superheated air, rises. That creates a vacuum down at the bottom of the fire and so into that vacuum rushes oxygen. Fresh air is sucked in to feed the fire. Now, as the, as the air rushes into the centre of the fire, it feeds the fire by giving it oxygen, and so the fire grows higher and hotter and keeps sucking in more and more air. As it's sucking in that air, of course, the, the rushing air, the rushing winds, can go up to 70 miles an hour. So these winds are being sucked into the centre of the fire. So we have massive fire and we have storm force winds. So we have a firestorm. He pushed on through the water. With each step it became more difficult. The hot smoke seared his lungs, tearing at his breath, standing up to his waist, not knowing what to do. Then quite suddenly a hot wind struck his face. It came out of nowhere, whipping into his eyes and churning up the water with terrific violence. The waves began heaving and crashing against him. The spray blinded his eyes. It was impossible to continue. Hiroshima's firestorm had begun.
that's the story of a Hiroshima survivor, Dr Hilda, who tried to fight his way through the river to reach his hospital in the city so that he could be of some assistance to survivors. And of course he was there in the clogged river when the firestorm began. I took that account from the book Shockwave, The Countdown to Hiroshima by Stephen Walker. In this episode, which, yes, is a distressing one, we will look at firestorms. I've been prompted to do this because this week is the 75th anniversary of the bombing of Dresden and of the firestorms which incinerated much of the East German city on 13th of February 1945. We associate firestorms with nuclear bombs and with nuclear war. And yet Dresden and also Hamburg and Tokyo endured hellish firestorms in the Second World War, all of which were caused by conventional explosives. So that's something to chew on, isn't it? Something to keep us awake at night. A firestorm which, as we'll see, produces something which is almost hell on earth doesn't even require a nuclear bomb. It can be achieved with normal conventional bombs. So let's look at what a firestorm actually is. How does it differ from an ordinary fire? And then we'll hear some harrowing accounts from survivors of the Second World War firestorms. But first, what is a firestorm? To understand it, we need to remember what we were all taught at school in our science lessons, and that's that warm air rises. I was also taught that in home economics, and that's why you never put a pie, for example, which is cooling, onto the bottom shelf of your fridge. Otherwise, the remnants of any warmth it's giving off will drift up through the fridge and emit warmth to everything else in there. So warm air rises. Basic principle of science and of pies. And it's the same basic principle which explains a firestorm. When bombs are dropped in a city, naturally fires start on the ground. But if conditions are right and enough of these individual fires are able to meet, They can create a large fire, of course, a conflagration, and together will create superheated air, which of course is rising. As the hot air from this huge fire rises, it leaves a vacuum. And another basic lesson from school, nature abhors a vacuum, and so cooler air from the surrounding area will be sucked into the fire. This new, fresh air is, of course, filled with oxygen. And, science lesson number three, we all know that oxygen feeds a flame. So as the cooler air is sucked in, so it feeds the fire, and so the fire rushes higher and hotter and sucks in even more air. So if the mass of fire is pulling air in from its surroundings, It is, of course, creating violent winds. After all, it doesn't politely nod and invite the air in. It pulls it in, it sucks it in, it rips it towards its centre. And so we have violent winds created on the ground. So we have fire and we have storm force winds. We have a firestorm. In his book, Inferno, which is about the bombing of Hamburg and, of course, the resulting firestorm in 1943, Keith Lowe explains how weather conditions can also help create firestorms. He talks about the warm, sultry weather Hamburg had been enjoying before the air raid. This weather had created a pocket of warm air which hung above the city and which had been made even warmer still because of recent air raids and their fires. These had thrown smoke particles up into the air which held and retained heat. But above and beyond this huge pocket of warm air was cooler air. Keith Lowe says, quote, 
surrounded on all sides by this colder air, the pocket of warm air was like a huge pressurised balloon sticking up some 10,000 feet. All it would take to burst the top of this balloon was a sharp rise in temperature. Once it had burst, the warm air over the city would rise unrestricted for thousands of feet, rapidly drawing newer air behind it and setting off the greatest firestorm the world has ever seen. Another factor which helped create firestorms was the type of bombs used. In Hamburg and Dresden, for example, the RAF dropped a mix of explosive bombs and incendiary bombs. The explosive bombs, of course, were designed to batter and crush, but the idea wasn't to batter and crush to the extent that you knocked all the buildings down, for if you did that, then you'd be creating huge big gaps, big bomb sites, and those would act as fire breaks. No, the best thing to do, if you want a firestorm, is to drop enough explosive bombs to knock out roofs and windows and doors, but leave most of the buildings upright. You then have a cityscape which has turned into a gutted, empty maze, and you then drop incendiary bombs which will start tremendous fires, and these fires will now have free rain to swoop through the open roofs, the toothless windows, the empty door frames, tearing its way without impediment through the shattered city. Now let's look at what it was like to endure a firestorm. We have witness testimony from Dresden, Hamburg and Tokyo, and of course Incredibly, we have survivors of the two nuclear firestorms of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Obviously, we have the dreadful heat of the fire and the dreadful force of the winds. And we'll turn to those in a second. But first, let's consider the sound of the firestorm. One of my favourite stories is that of the Dyatlov Pass. If you're not familiar with it, I do suggest you look it up after this podcast. It refers to an incident in the Ural Mountains of the Soviet Union, which happened in 1959. It is genuinely terrifying. And for a while, I was quite obsessed with it, reading everything that I could find about it. My niece, uh, she's seven and nothing frightens her. I've told her bedtime stories about Myra Hindley and I've shown her the bombing scene from Threads, but nothing scares her except the evening when I tucked her into bed and I knelt down beside her ponies and her Shopkins and I started to tell her about the Dyatlov Pass story. Now this nipper, who's undaunted by nuclear war and the Moors murders, pulled the blankets up around her chin and said, Can we stop now? In brief, a group of experienced hikers went missing during an expedition into the snowy mountains. They were eventually found, dead of course, scattered in different locations, some with horrible injuries. One was missing her eyeballs and tongue. There were also strange crush injuries to some of the corpses, and no one could explain what had happened. But that wasn't even the biggest mystery of the Dyatlov Pass story. The biggest mystery, and the most frightening thing, was Why did these intelligent, experienced hikers all suddenly leave the safety of their tent and rush out barefoot and ill-clothed into the snow? What happened to make them suddenly run? Indeed, their rush to leave the tent was so sudden that the tent had been ripped and slashed from the inside. So desperate was their panic to get out. They were so panicked that they'd rather have rushed barefoot into the Soviet snow than stay safe and warm inside. Why? We don't know, 
of course, but a decent theory, and one which I tend to favour, is that they were driven into a panic by noise. Now that might sound a bit silly, but I've had panic attacks before and can easily see how noise, a sudden and loud and unrelenting noise, could drive your panic higher and higher. So the theory of sound and the Dyatlov Pass is that the wind rushing down and around the mountaintops produced infrasound in a phenomenon known as a vortex street, which is known to induce panic in humans. I mentioned that incident, the Dyatlov Pass, because I can understand, as I said, how an unrelenting noise could make panic and terror worse. In a panicked and claustrophobic situation where you want to flee and breathe and suddenly your collar feels too tight and any sound is just another layer of chaos pressing down on you. How you wish for light, cool silence. So imagine then being on the ground in Dresden, for example, during the firestorm and you're having to contend with, as we said at the beginning of the podcast, something resembling hell on earth. And on top of the dreadful sight of people burning, of the flames enclosing you, on top of the scorching and charring of your skin and hair, on top of the suffocation, you've got the awful, all-encompassing, unrelenting roar of the firestorm. One survivor from Hamburg said, What a sound it was. It was hell. It was hell's fires. In hell, it is not only hot, but loud. The firestorm was screaming. Another survivor described the roar of the firestorm as like someone pressing all the keys on an old church organ. And consider that on top of the roar of the fire, above the flames, above all the clouds, above all the smoke, there's another noise and that is the drone of the bomber. Survivors on the ground have said how they heard the drone of the bombers coming in over the city, and that meant nothing other than more fire. They are here to drop more bombs, more incendiaries, and that will simply prolong and feed the firestorm which is already raging. So on the ground you have the screaming and the roaring of the fire, And above that you have the drone of the bombers. So that's the sound of the firestorm. But what did it feel like and look like down on the ground? Well, one horrific aspect is that the very ground beneath your feet could actually melt roads which were covered in tarmac would in some cases start to soften and bubble and people who were trying to flee would stumble and trip and be caught in the melting road surface as if it was some kind of quicksand. This is a scene of course which Cormac McCarthy recreates in his novel The Road and we've looked at that novel in a previous podcast episode called The Road if you want to look that up. In his novel he writes... Beyond a crossroads in that wilderness, they began to come upon the possessions of travellers abandoned in the road years ago. Boxes and bags. Everything melted and black. Old plastic suitcases curled shapeless in the heat. Here and there the imprint of things rested out of the tar by scavengers. A mile on and they began to come upon the dead. Figures half mired in the blacktop clutching themselves, mouths howling. Put his hand on the boy's shoulder. Take my hand, he said. I don't think you should see this. And compare that to the testimony of a survivor from Hamburg, quoted in Keith Lowe's book, Inferno. At some point in the night, I ran on once more with the dripping wet jacket of the dead man over my head. In this whirling fire, I had lost all sense of direction. On my way out of the chaos, I came across a burnt-out tram. The windows had melted in the heat. Dead bodies lay naked on top of one another in the carriage, 
Their clothes had disintegrated into embers. The people had tried to shelter there from the firestorm. In Aphistrasa they struggled for survival. Sinking into the hot tarmac, they had tried to support themselves with their hands and lay now on their knees. They ended their lives screaming with fear and pain. I could not help them. Another survivor who also saw the horrible sight of people trapped and stuck in the boiling road surface says, the asphalt was burning and boiling. I saw two women running, a young one and an older one, whose shoes got stuck in the boiling asphalt. They pulled their feet out of the shoes, but that wasn't a good idea because they had to step into the boiling asphalt. They fell and didn't get up again like flies in the hot wax of a candle. And another Hamburg survivor. I struggled to run against the wind in the middle of the street. We couldn't go on across the road because the asphalt had melted. There were people on the roadway, some already dead, some still lying alive but stuck in the asphalt. They must have rushed onto the roadway without thinking. Their feet have got stuck and they'd put out their hands to try and get out again. They were on their hands and knees screaming. these attacks, the German overseas news agency said, this city, hitherto almost untouched, has been carpeted by heavy and super heavy high explosives and incendiaries. Dresden is a heap of ruins. It has been smashed to atoms. Before these attacks, Dresden was planned as a substitute capital in place of Berlin. After this, Hitler will have to look for a substitute for the substitute. A news report there about the bombing of Dresden, delivered in that perky tone most British wartime newsreels had. So how were the firestorms reported in the press, both then and later? Well, I found a very (laughs) strange report in the Times from 1981, claiming that the people of Hamburg, despite the firestorms and the bombing and the defeat, are so fond of Britain and they feel a kinship with us. Even during the war, even as we were bombing Hamburg, according to this article, the Hamburgers, as they hunkered in their cellar, felt no hate. I'll quote here from the article. Herr Rudolf Walter Lehnhardt, deputy editor of the great Hamburg-based weekly Die Zeit, and for many years correspondent in London, tells a story of a group of Hamburgers sitting in an air raid shelter. A solitary British plane approaches and the German ak ak opens fire. The engine cuts out and someone says, poor chap, I hope he'll be all right. I don't know if that experience was reflected in every other air raid shelter across Hamburg where they were expressing a concern, polite concern for the bomber crews. But this article, uh, written during the Cold War, of course, when Germany was divided, so perhaps that colours the tone of it. But the article insists that the hamburgers are just like the British. It ends by saying, Partly it's because we are closely related. Our ancestors, the Angles, Saxons and Jutes, came from just north of here. We have similar temperaments. Plattdeutsch, the dialect of the region, is very close to English. The lush green Hamburg suburbs, the flat grey coastline and fenlands, the hedgerows and thatch cottages with hollyhocks in the countryside look for all the world as if Britain were just down the road, not miles away over the North Sea. Well, how lovely. That implies that the hamburgers didn't really mind. Although as a justification for this um, stance, the article does say... It is astonishing that hamburgers bear no resentment for the war, despite the carnage, the bombed city and the requisitioned homes. Hamburg, they explained, did not support Hitler and always felt it had not been their war 
Again with the Times, they reported from Dresden in 1946, headlined The Wreckage of Dresden, a Catalogue of Ruin and Desolation. To visit Dresden today is at once a saddening and a heartening experience. It's saddening because so much beauty extinguished seemingly beyond repair. It is heartening because hope exists, with apparently the energy to realise it, that a new Dresden will, within measurable time, be built on the ruins of the old. But until that reconstruction began, the article calls Dresden a dead city. It says the centre of Dresden is dead. No trams run along some of the main streets. There are no shops, for there are no more buildings. Six square miles of the inner town are in ruins. The destruction extended to some of the suburbs in the south and west, and it's officially estimated that 27,000 houses and 7,000 public buildings were completely destroyed, among them half the churches and half the schools. And it refers to the night of the firestorm, saying, most of this destruction happened in one night, the night of February the 13th to the 14th last year. During that night, there were two air raids on Dresden, which was then full of refugees who had streamed in from the east before the advancing Russian armies. In the two attacks, and mostly in the first, 25,000 people were killed, and German officials estimate that 30,000 more were injured. It goes on to say thousands of people were trapped in the cellars of burning buildings. Of those who got out, many were unable to get through the burning streets. It is believed that there are still 6,000 bodies under the ruins. Are we to take comfort in the fact that you don't actually need a nuclear war to invoke such hellish destruction? Perhaps the nuclear bomb wasn't such a terrible break with the past after all. Well, that's cold comfort indeed. I hope you liked the music in this episode and that it was sufficiently dark and atmospheric. It comes courtesy of X and you can find them on Twitter at XBandUK. This has obviously been a very grim episode. Uh, maybe we'll try and find something lighter for next week. Maybe a look at all the <laughs> jaunty atomic themed pop music of the 50s. That might perk us up. How does that sound? Remember, if you're a patron of my podcast, um, some patrons have the benefit of suggesting or nominating a podcast episode so if you have that as one of your benefits please do make use of it let me know if you have a particular subject or theme you would like me to discuss in a podcast episode and if you want to join my patreon and support this podcast with a donation each month please take a look at patreon.com forward slash atomic hobo let me give a thank you to the patrons who support this podcast my latest patron is Michelle B, who signed up yesterday. Thank you, Michelle. And let me also thank Gordy McNair, Steve Sace, Phil Catling, Mary Freer, Ben Capper, Wynn Grant, Paul Maxwell Walters, Sean Judge, Simon Allison, Kevin Butter, Linda Wilnuff, and Ian McCulloch. And I'll be back next week with another episode. And as I promised, I'll try and do something a bit later because this episode was very grim and quite hard work, but that's the nature of this subject, isn't it? Thank you all for listening. <laughs>